One of the rarest and most beautiful gemstones on Earth is derived from 71 million year old ammonite fossils. Ammonites are found all over the world. There are over 10,000 species known from the fossil record, but only a select few found within the Bear Paw Formation in the foothills of Alberta, Canada, developed this iridescence. Many believe that these ammonites contain positive cosmic energy that's been absorbed through the Earth over millions of years. Early Blackfoot lore relates the history of Iniskim, or Buffalo Stone, to the ammonites found in this area. Feng Shui practitioners believe an energy known as Qi is embodied in its multitude of colors. The layers are patterned like a rainbow and may contain the full range of the visible spectrum. No two pieces are alike. It wasn't until 1981 that the unique material derived from these fossils would be internationally recognized as a gemstone. It was named Amylite. The ammonites first appear about 400 million years ago in the Devonian period, or a little bit earlier. And they are a group of mollusks, which today include clams and octopus and squid. And all mollusks produce a shell via an organ called the mantle. And this mantle controls the precipitation of calcium carbonate. So the animals take the calcium and the carbonate out of the seawater and they help crystallize it on the edge of the shell to produce a new growing rim. As the animal grows, it needs a little more room. So this grows in this beautiful spiral pattern. The floor stitches itself to the outer part of the shell, and the animal only lives in the end chamber. So this chamber has been cut here on the end, but it would be about this big. Just enough room that it can pull itself in and shut a little mucus door for protection. If you think about how octopi and squid catch their food today. They have tentacles and they have little sucker discs and they have little rough hooklets in there. They could grab foods and they had good eyes, good vision. They would have actively searched out prey and then when they detected it, they would creep up on it and these tentacles would shoot out, grab things and pull them in. They could put their body gases in or they could put their body fluids in move up and down with ballast, much like a submarine does. And they had a little siphon, and they were jet propelled. I call ammonite uh, the original philosopher stone. I mean, other people have used that, but ammonites are the most prolific fossil, uh, probably in the geological record. They're found on every continent, wherever there were oceans, and and that was everywhere for 400 million years. They, they just uh, dominated the planet. The ammonites survived two major extinctions. They squeaked through each time. There was one at the end of the Triassic at about 210 million. And there was another really bad one at the end of the Permian at 250 million. Just a handful of species squeaked through. But each time, the ammonites quickly re-evolved to give you thousands of more species and they, they survived these two mass extinctions, but the third one, the end Cretaceous one, finished them off. Ammonites thrived in the world's oceans for hundreds of millions of years, but they would ultimately go extinct with the dinosaurs. Despite being one of the most common fossils on the planet, only a select few species found along the eastern slopes of the Rocky Mountains in southern Alberta, Canada, have developed the gemstone known as amylite. The ammonites with this iridescence were deposited into the Bear Paw Formation over 71 million years ago. The Bear Paw Formation represents the inland Bear Paw Sea, 
which was at one point in time connected through the Western Interior Seaway all the way from the Arctic Ocean down to the Gulf of Mexico and out towards Hudson's Bay. It was a constant rain of fine silts and muds and sometimes sands that built up layers and we can see these layers now exposed in the valleys in southern Alberta. Back in the late 90s, early 2000s, we spent some time trying to characterize what is the difference between the, the various shell materials. Some of the shell material is very iridescent, some of it is not, all from the same formation. And what we found is the way the Alberta geologically sits is that the western part of the province, the rocks were tilted and they're more deeply buried in the west than they are in the east. And so even though you have this common layer of shale and sediment, we call the bear paw formation, and there's these fossils that are scattered more or less uniformly across, the ones that are buried in the west versus the ones in the east were more deeply buried, maybe up to four kilometers to some analysis has suggested. So what we believe is that there's been some sort of heat and pressure with the depth of burial that changed the shell material to give us these vivid colors. Most of the calcium carbonate that we find in fossil shells has been changed to a mineral called calcite. But when the animals were alive, they deposited it as a mineral called aragonite. The shells we find in the bear paw formation rocks are still preserved as the mineral aragonite, the original biologic mineral. It's thought this ammonite shell has been heated and pressurized just right to preserve that original shiny shell layer and also enhance the colors. There have been over 30 permits issued to mine for ammonites on the Blood Reserve in Southern Alberta. Permitting is issued through the band and is only available to members of the Blood Tribe. It stipulates they may only use hand tools to dig. Every year, as the river rises and falls, it exposes new outcrops and new opportunities to search for these fossils. Many earn their living this way. What they find is often sold to others in the industry, private collectors, or kept for their personal collections. Some refer to these ammonites as modern day buffalo due to their rich history as it relates to aniskum or buffalo stone. When you go back to the origin of the story a thousand years ago. There was one certain Blackfoot clan in this geographical area that was having a very rough go in the wintertime. The buffalo weren't accessible, deer and, and rabbits and, and the likes were also very scarce. And every day the people of the tribe would pray in earnest and ask the creator for some sort of assistance. So one night a young lady has a dream and in this dream a spirit visits her and tells her the creator has heard your prayers and he sees your struggle. And he sent me, the spirit, to give you a gift. And this gift is gonna come in the form of a stone called an iniskin, buffalo stone. It also gave her instructions on where to find it, what to look for. The signature marks in the landscape, there'll be indicators that'll tell her she is near, but the most important indicator, and you'll hear this song coming from this stone. The spirit told her, perform this ceremony and sing these songs, and those songs along with the stone will bring the buffalo to you. So she woke in the morning, she told her husband, I had this dream, and he told her, prepare and go find this stone. So he called all the people of the camp together and he said, Creator has heard our prayers and he's answered us. She was sent on her way to find it. And as she went through the valley, she started seeing the little indicators that the spirit had said she would see. And then she heard that song. And as she followed and got closer, it got louder and louder until it brought her to a small stone that was sitting there waiting for her. She picked up the stone and she brought it back to the camp and she presented it to her husband and told her husband, this is the gift. And he said, what do we do now? So we prepare for a ceremony to him. Singing the songs that the spirit has given me and performing the ceremony through prayers as instructed. She also said, there's two signs that are gonna show this promise is gonna to come to fruition. First one is the storm's gonna come in from the north. The dream instructed us to tether down our teepees, bring in our personal belongings, so the people went and did that. The second sign was that a buffalo was gonna come and he's gonna wander through the camp tonight. 
However, we're not to harm this buffalo. The dream instructed her to tell the camp to tie their dogs. As the night grew on, the storm started to move in. And those that didn't prepare, their teepees were being blown over, their, their personal effects were being blown about. And they ran for refuge to where the ceremonies were going on. And as the ceremony went on through the night, the dogs started barking. And when they looked out, they could see this buffalo meandering through the teepee. And they were instructed not to harm that buffalo. Got towards morning, the storm subsided, and there was a dead calm. There was no wind at all. As the sun rose in the east, there was drifts everywhere. And just outside the camp was a small herd of buffalo that were trapped in chest deep snow. The people of the camp were able to go out and dispatch those buffaloes and then provide food, shelter, and clothing throughout the rest of the winter. Because the buffalo stone is a byproduct or is derived from segments of the ammonite and or the bacolite. It was given to our people a thousand years ago to bring assistance, luck, and prosperity in the hunt, and the hunt meant food, shelter, and clothing. And since that time, the Blackfoot people have revered this stone. The songs and prayers are passed on from generation to generation. They attend annual ceremonies where their rocks are blessed and painted, signifying renewal of their luck and prosperity. The women dance with the stones while the men sing the songs, giving thanks for the gift the Creator has given. Despite their significance, most of these Ammonites would lay untouched along the St. Mary River. But in 1877, the river became the eastern boundary of the Blood Reserve through the signing of Treaty 7. And in 1917, D.B. Dowling with the Geological Survey of Canada provided the first description of iridescent ammonite shells from samples recognized in 1908. A few decades later, the rise of these spectacular fossils to international stardom as the world's newest gemstone, amylite, would begin. The history of amylite goes back to the 60s. The Nanton Rock Club used to come down in this area and collect along the river valleys, and they discovered amylite and started making the first cabochons. But uh, amylite can fall apart if it's not uh, stabilized, and uh, they had some problems with it. It's not until uh, 1967, a gentleman by the name of Santo Carboni, he had permission from the Carmes to walk the riverbanks here. That was a young gentleman too, uh, studying to be a geologist. He had also permission from the Carmes. So one day he grabbed a piece of what we call the natural caisson to Mr. Carboni. He polished the first stone in his lab on that Monday. And then he said, wow, we got something. So he came and talked to the Carmes. He said, I think we got something here. And they decided to form Canadian Chloride. Santo had all the equipment because he prepared mineral samples as part of his job with the geological survey. And so he had lapping equipment and cutting equipment. And he knew the techniques uh, used to make Lightning Ridge Black Opal, which is the most expensive colored gemstone right now. So uh, Santo was the first person who was able to make a stable stone. In those same years, a gentleman by the name of René van der Veel, our former uh, chairman, he was collecting Sunday picnic with the family just for the fun of it. And then he got to see the, that stone. And then he saw, wow, that has potential. So he quit his uh, job at the time, find some backers, and bought out uh, the Carmes. About 35 years ago, I came to Banff. At that time, uh, we had a lot of foreign tourists, as we do now. And a gentleman came in, and he was one of the founders of Corite. His name was René Vanderville. He came in, and he showed me something very unique. He showed me some gemstones that were found only in Alberta. At that time, they hadn't been named Amylite. So I thought this was absolutely unnatural, because people would be coming from all over the world. They can find something that's made specifically in Alberta, and it's beautiful. It was a, a weekly process with René Vanderveld. They would uh, find the stones on the Mondays and Tuesdays. They would do the polishing and cleaning on the Wednesdays and Thursdays, go out to Banff on Fridays, sell to all the stores, and then do the same thing over and over again. Then he finally find Dr. Gublin, 
in Switzerland. He was in charge of the Commission of Colorstone, giving some simple, a little bit of the geology of the Berpa. Dr. Gublin said, wow, this is beautiful. He said it deserved to have the gem status. And he's the one that called it Amorlite. And he named it as such with the L standing for lith. So the name Amolite actually means stone of the Ammonite. So now we had a gemstone. As the demand for Amolite grew, so did the need for a commercial mine. Corite began mining the Cormos Ranch in 1983 in what is unofficially known as the K Zone. Since 2001, Commercial mining has been primarily in the blue zone, where the material is typically thicker and more brilliant in color. Amylite jewelry is most commonly assembled into triplets, with a natural backing, layer of amylite, and a quartz or spinel cap. Once an area has been mined, the land is reclaimed and returned to its original condition. In spring 2001, amylite was featured on the cover of Gems and Gemology magazine, solidifying its place in the gemstone world. Specimens are on display in museums around the globe, and feng shui, chakra, and other healing practitioners believe amylite holds the vibrational energies of the universe. It has been called the seven color prosperity stone and the most influential gemstone of the millennium. we find, they keep them. The rest are granted to Corite as a gift. Got my body, take my soul. Colors of the rock gonna carry us home. Where you leave me, I will go. Listen for the call of the buffalo stone. The gem on the pancake part is only about a tenth of a millimeter thick. So I have to do it really gently or else I'll burn through it. Earth rose, you can see all the buffalo. Tribal cry that will touch all the seas. Watch them fly off the cliffs as they fall below. One of the spectacular things about amylite is that it is spectrochromatic. So when viewed from different angles, it does change color. my body take my soul colors of the rock gonna carry us home where you lead me i will go listen for the call of the buffalo stone Buffalo. 